Hello, everyone. And uh, wow, waiting. thanks for waiting till the end of the day. Um, and uh, let's talk about augmented reality, but not just overlaying information, overlaying virtuals into the real world, but physically inserting something uh, in the real world, like you are seeing on this Taj Mahal. Uh, so John, first of all, uh, congratulations for a fantastic area. And also thank you for inviting me. Now, when we think about you know, our working environments, uh, it's very multimodal. It's not a phone, it's not just a phone, not just a desktop, not just a laptop, not just large screen, but it's multimodal. You know, we're we are interacting with the physical and real world in many, many ways. And as Patty, Patty may say in the morning, you know, mobile phone seems like, uh, you know, a monocall, something you have to take out. Uh, and that's why we have this multimodal interaction that's going on. When you look at um, hospitals, right, uh, it's the same thing. Yes, they have something on their head, but there are lots of other information uh, that's being projected. People are looking at each other, they're collaborating with each other and so on. And this multiple modes of interactions are very, very important. So when it comes to augmented reality, it's also very important to realize that there are many ways we're going to insert or overlay virtual information on the real objects. It's not just going to be headsets. It's not just a magic mirror uh, through a tablet but many, many other modes. And this is how we typically think of augmented reality, you know, uh, uh, a, a head-mounted or head-worn display that has some kind of a ability to, you know, have augmentation of your view. In this case, kind of an X-ray vision that allows the surgeon to look uh, inside a patient. And it's kind of a classic pipeline of augmented reality. We start with the world. We want to input, process, output, and world. And I would really say, you know, uh, this is kind of a motto of my group, Camera Culture at MIT, which is, you know, we really want to sense the world in a way that's well beyond the human ability. Then we want to abstract and synthesize it and present it so that it's well within human comprehensibility. And that's how we are going to create these uh, superhuman abilities. So then let's look at some of these pieces of the puzzle, right? From input, we're going to use cameras and capture of technologies. You know, for processing, we're going to machine learning, computer vision. Uh, for output, we're going to displays and overlays. And, you know, we are mainly talking about the optical aspect of it, kind of cameras and displays. Uh, so let's go a little bit deeper in that. By the way, that's Henry Fuchs, my, uh, my advisor at, at UNC. And kind of the imaging or, or optical uh, uh, view of AR is that we have kind of the, the you know, the, 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 you know the, the photon axis, the photon hacking you know, the amazing optics, amazing displays. And, you know, you will see people from that world often say, hey, it doesn't really matter how your rest of your stuff is. The only thing that matters is the photons. And, you know, I would call them kind of optical chauvinists. <laughs> and the people who are on the horizontal axis, they say, no, no, as long as there's really good AR kit and really good processing on existing mobile phones, we can create the best AR. And kind of I would call them kind of computational chauvinists. Uh, but in reality, I think the, the real action is in the middle of the two, thinking about computational imaging, the light transport, how the light is bouncing around uh, in the scene. And just kind of, you know, uh, the last talk of the day, so I want to kind of also loop back to some of the history of the field. I mean, we did have, you know, um, you know head-worn AR displays, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, you know, kind of a combination of a view master with an LCD. Uh, and then also wanted to show that, you know, this Ron Azuma's uh, prototypes when I was a grad student at UNC. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that were out there, you know, 25 years ago that look really slick uh, and really tiny. Uh, so, you know, this has been around for quite some time. Um, so what if I told you that there's a way to create AR that's in the real world, it doesn't require tracking, doesn't require any tethered gears, it's multi-person and all the 3D cues are available, you know, accommodation, occlusion, and all those cues. How would you do that? You know, that should be our ultimate game. But in some ways, those solutions are already here. And, and that's multimodal. So instead of thinking about a head-worn display, if we use a spatial augmented reality, augmenting our space rather than just our view, uh, that's possible. And on the right, I'm showing you, uh, you know, the projector-based thing. So it's part of my thesis, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. Uh, of how you would do that. So when it comes to multi-mode AR, you know, there are real objects and you can augment them in multiple ways, right? You can have, you know, something that's near the eye, an arm's length, you know, in the room, 
or directly on the object. So there are so many ways to augment your view. Uh, and this, we have seen many of these all day today, right? And the, the, the fact of the matter is we need all of them to create a true AR display, right? And we might call them head-worn or body-attached, uh, but what I'm really going to talk about for the next few minutes is this notion of augmenting the space, not just augmenting your view or, or your display. Um, and, you know, dialing back time, shader lamps uh, is a notion that you can change not just your view, but you can change the reflectance, the BRDF of objects. You can bring in virtual illumination, like on this Taj Mahal. We can create virtual motions. We can interact with objects that are actually very mundane and dull, but uh, augment them with projectors and LCDs and holograms, as I'll show you. Um, and this is really an idea that we can use lamps, in this case projectors, to colorfully shade the world. And those, that's why they're called shader lamps. Uh, and I was very delighted, you know, over time, uh, this has really taken off now. You know, you can go to, you know, uh, trade shows and very really augmenting things in 3D, you know, not just a 2D augmentation because, you know, desktop augmentation or tabletop augmentation was around. And now we've seen this really amazing uh, uh, kind of philosophies of how you would augment the world. You don't need, you know, it's multi-person, all the cues are present. You don't need head tracking, right? Uh, and it's, it's very, very natural. Uh, and we have seen, you know, kind of guerrilla marketing as well, projecting on the on the Big Ben here in in London. Um, and there have been kind of medical products like the vein viewer, where you have a near IR camera that uh, looks at your subcutaneous veins uh, in uh, near IR wavelength. And then there's a projector that augments directly onto the onto the hand. In this case, uh, you know, a visible green color, so a nurse can easily decide, you know, where to poke. Uh, your vein um, uh, instead of you know, drawing it all the time. And then others have shown not only you can have projectors that are installed in a, in a fixed setting, but you can in fact put projectors on your head. Um, and so Yannick Roland and, and Huang Wa were kind of really the leaders of this field for, for many years and they continue to produce amazing work, um, have shown that, hey, even having projectors. And, and you know, like, like uh, Barmak talked about having waveguides uh, for AR, I think we are coming back to this notion of a projector on your head, except that now the projector is projecting on some kind of a bird bath uh, waveguide optics. Uh, but in reality, the same projectors can also project what's out there in the real world as well. And th when it comes to kind of processing, you know, computer vision, machine learning, identifying, tracking, understanding, and so on, you know, we talked about maybe having projectors in your mobile phones, right? Uh, and it nicely has a Mitsubishi electric logo because that's, you know, those were the people who were funding my work back then when I was at Merle. And uh, I'm, I'm curious why we wouldn't have a projector uh, in our pocket so that we can interact with the world, not by having something that's head worn with worrying about head tracking, but something that you can carry uh, in your hand as well. Um, and this does involve some of the issues that you would have in a traditional head worn augmented reality, you still have to do pre-processing. At runtime, you have to do identification and registration and create interaction. Um, uh, but the problems are significantly simpler uh, than what you would have uh, in a head-mounted display. Of course, there are other benefits that you have at Char, and that's why we have to think about this multimodal thing. And in Cigarette 2004, we showed that you know, in a warehouse setting, you know, I mean, you're not going to expect a warehouse worker to put on you know, something on their head for you know, eight hours a day. And as John was talking about in the morning from Copen, you know, maybe the military wants to use the head-mounted display all day long, but for entertainment and productivity, you, you might want to use some other mode uh, of AR uh, as well. Um, and then Mark was talking about this, Mark, Mark Billinghurst, about all kinds of very fundamental problems we need to solve. And you should really go and see some of Mark's you know, original uh, original papers. I mean, you know, it's it looks kind of odd now with this large um, large barcodes and so on. But that's only because the cameras back then were kind of VGA. If you had to run something in real time, uh, but now you can use something much simpler. And you know, back in the '90s, kind of the this QR codes were taking over the world. People are putting large QR codes on top of a building, and fortunately, they didn't they didn't kind of win the battle. Uh, and you know, we have something that's more location aware and location sensitive. Uh, we did talk about kind of augmenting the world instead of this QR codes or barcodes using something called a bow code, which is like just a tiny dot, a micro dot 
And if you take a picture of that out of focus, not by zooming, but by just out of focus, you can actually see the whole pattern. Uh, and this kind of angle sensitive barcodes uh, are going to be very critical as we start augmenting real world objects to help for authoring, for tracking, and a whole range of applications. Now, when it comes to spatially augmented reality, augmenting the space, uh, I would say, you know, Professor Hiroshishi at MIT has done some phenomenal work. And one of the, my favorite projects uh, from his lab is this notion of kind of an actuated surface where, uh, uh, um, where you have this um, uh, very traditional interactive workbenches, uh, but in reality, you can have a, a magnetic loop underneath that, can, that allows you to move physical objects almost like a magic. They move on top of the tabletop. Uh, so you know, if it's a remote interaction, the remote person can actually move these objects around. And if you have seen some other work from Hiroshi's group, like the transform system and so on, uh, he's really bringing kind of what's tangible and what's digital uh, you know, through his tangible uh, bits project. So many pieces of this puzzle of augmenting our space are, are, are coming together. So when it comes to kind of hacking photons or hacking bits, we do need to think about this core design of how not only light, but everything that relates to optics and signal processing and computer vision and machine learning is actually going to help us uh, you know, create this illusion of co-presence. Um, and when coming back to this pipeline about cameras, uh, you know, my group is called Camera Culture, uh, and many of you in the room here have shown some fantastic efforts in moving cameras, but I think we are still trying to mimic a human eye. Uh, you know, and if you think about kind of aircrafts don't mimic birds, they still use Bernoulli principle, but they don't flap wings. Uh, and, you know, a computer chip doesn't try to mimic a human brain and has a very different, uh, you know, philosophy behind it. But cameras, unfortunately, continue to mimic the human eye. And, and now we have an opportunity to go beyond that. Uh, so in fact, in our group, we are thinking about cameras in every possible modality. You know, camera using Wi-Fi, camera using ultrasound, camera using terahertz. Uh, and so on. And I think those are going to be very important pieces of making augmented reality in our space uh, possible. And when we talk about displays, you know, we have been, we have been promised uh, curved screens um, and, you know, kind of this uh, monostable or bistable e-inks, uh, but we still haven't seen them uh, come around uh, in our environment. So we started looking at this problem a few years ago and created something called a slow display. You know, and the dream material is a sticky pixel, which is you project on this pixel, project on this point in the world just once, and the pixel just persists. It's like drawing on that wall with a marker. You just draw once, and, and the marker ink just stays on the whiteboard as long as you want, whether it's the daytime or nighttime. Uh, and so if you go to slowdisplay.org, what we created was a fusion of phosphorescent and photochromic material, which when illuminated with you know, a particular wavelength of light, keeps the pixels stuck uh, on the wall. And the low display or the sticky pixels are probably going to be an important part of creating displays that are persistent uh, for augmentation in our world as well. Uh, and then my friend Oliver Bimber uh, in, 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 in Austria uh, and also Germany has been doing some amazing work on how you can project on holograms. Now, holograms on their own are static, uh, and, but create extremely high resolution uh, 3D cues. Uh, and projectors on their own usually are low resolution, but can create a dynamic, uh, uh, you know, dynamic and, and video rate uh, overlays. So the combination of the two actually allows you to create uh, something uh, really amazing. It's, it's worth checking out some of its projects. So whether it's display screens, whether it's sticky pixels, whether it's holograms, there are many ways to create pixels in our space rather than on our view or in our hand. So that's, that's spatial augmented reality. And you know, we have heard some amazing talks this morning. You know, uh, uh, Copin, John Fan was talking about don't, over, don't overwhelm the environment uh, by inserting digital, uh, uh, insert digital uh, uh, elements, and also don't overwhelm your real senses. You know, Paiti was talking about how we need to, how we need to free ourselves from this notion of a monocle. You know, Mark was talking about, let's improve the fundamentals, and Hiroshi, one of some of my favorite projects, uh, intangible bits. And Steve also reminded, you know, things are going on for 50 years, uh, you know, literally this year uh, from, from Evan Sutherland. 
Um, and when I hear about all of these things, it really feels like augmenting our space should be also an extremely high priority for us. Um, and 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 uh, not just a uh, you know a single track exploration of what's uh, on your head. So I want to leave you with this thought. Uh, imagine you know in the future um, um, you know we want to kind of really help uh, the people who are disadvantaged. You know somebody who doesn't make much money walks into their apartment and flips a switch. You know maybe they don't have windows, they don't have great furniture. They flip a switch. And they see, you know, a beautiful apartment with great views uh, and something that looks, you know, really polished, really modern. Now, for this, are we going to expect this person to put on something on their head, or are we just going to augment uh, their space? So, I think, you know, time has come to really think about AR uh, in multi-more, whether it's personal, whether it's enterprise, whether it's in hospitals, whether it's entertainment, whether it's for design, whether it's for architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.